In the Steam trailer for the horror-like exploration survival game Sunless Sea, there's a moment where the player's boat is steaming along, minding its own business, only for a massive eye to open up below and start looking around, turning what was thought to be shallow water into something much, much worse. Knowing that something like this is present in the game is the kind of thing that would almost preclude me from ever playing it. The sheer dread this moment of footage creates in me is astounding. The internet has assigned a particular association to the word cringe these days, but it's moments like this that remind me the action can be something much bigger. A small movement in physical space, but a much deeper and darker one in the mind. So, needless to say, I played the hell out of Sunless Sea. <laughs> like, I, I played a lot of Sunless Sea over the years, and oddly enough, I never actually found that giant eye, or whatever it belongs to, as far as I can tell. There is a part of me that is somewhat disappointed that I never had this encounter in the game, and to be honest, I don't actually know if it happens in the game itself. It may have just been something for the trailer to hook your attention and pull you in. I mean, it worked on me for reasons I don't fully understand. After all, I am pretty terrified of the sea. I hate the idea of being out on the open water. Stranded or not, it doesn't really matter. The idea of the nearest shore being beyond my ability to reach or even just see makes me nervous. It's not the water itself that freaks me out, though. Even though I don't swim that often anymore, I'm a strong swimmer. No, it's the emptiness below that gets me. The endless dark that claws away my ability to do something that should come as naturally to me as stand on my own two feet. The vast expanse that may not be another planet, but is certainly another world far away from the one I know is an overwhelming concept to me on its own, but it's what could be calling that darkness home that really chills me to the core. Imagination is a heck of a drug, and it certainly doesn't help that looking up all of what does actually live down there, like four real animals that you could in theory go out and find and look at with your real eyeballs, do a good enough job of being that kind of terrifying on their own. I get freaked out by deep water, that's how you sum it up. And yet, I'm often surprised by just how drawn to nautical or seafaring stories, movies, and games I tend to be. I am fascinated, hypnotized, enchanted by the pull. I guess you could say I feel the call of the sea. I find the idea of all of this fascinating, and so I would argue that it was more than appropriate that on the day of its release, I positively pounced on Black Salt Games' 2023 release, Dredge. And I was not disappointed. I don't tend to play a lot of life sim games. Stardew Valley is the big exception, which I have accidentally put 200 hours into twice now. And usually when I get into the idea of needing some calm, relaxing chores to do, I just fire up a new Minecraft save and that's what does it for me. But it didn't take much to sell me on the idea of Dredge. There was definitely something enchanting about the idea of managing a fishing boat. The calm, serene waters, picturesque islands, boat maintenance, and communing with the waters around me felt like something I could really get into. And everything was just like I expected. Steaming around the little islands I was posted up at in the beginning of the game was a welcoming landing pad. Fishing in the local area was relaxing, selling my catches was satisfying, getting me money needed to fix up my boat and make it better, it was all coming together. But, oh, the sun has gone down while I wasn't paying attention, and something is wrong here. <laughs> you know that feeling, like you're being watched? I'd better use the foghorn, let people know where I am, and... Oh. 
question was, was that you? Ah, yes, spooky man I've never met before, peeking in my window, asking me to meet him in an abandoned mansion on a deserted island. That's exactly how I wanted this morning to go. Oh, this fish doesn't look right. I might as well get rid of it, but the fishmonger seems really into it, and he's paying extra. Okay, so this place is weird. And all of this weirdness continues to grow as the game goes on. Yeah. Dredge is essentially a horror game, which I did know going in. And all of the selling points that I listed before, the serene waters, the fixing up the boat, that's all still there, and was indeed a real draw, but the added angle of this game diving into some eldritch weirdness and straight-up ocean horror was just too much to pass up. I'm always astonished by how much a sense of dread can turn into fascination under the right circumstances, but really, I shouldn't be. It's that exact thing that has led me to plenty of other games over the years. Sunless Sea, which I've already brought up in this video, is exactly the kind of game that I'm talking about. The idea of being out on a boat, on a vast body of water, with who knows what living in it, was some floating towards a pie cooling on a windowsill levels of compelling for me. So much about the game spoke to exactly what made me nervous about it, while still holding tight to the logistical elements that made it as addicting as it was for me. During all of the time I played Sunless Sea, though, I couldn't help but be a little disappointed by the way my fear and unease which I had surrounding this game was of a different sort than I was expecting. It is primarily a survival game, and it will often push you to the brink, wondering if your supplies or fuel or both will hold out long enough for you to complete your current voyage, and will you even have enough money to resupply if you get home at all? But what I tend to be most freaked out by in this setting doesn't really enter into the equation in any meaningful way here. While Sunless Sea has lots to discover and take in as it is, very rarely is what is under the water a going concern in the play of the game. At no point does something show up to make you reconsider ever going out on the water again. You don't, or at least I, never wound up in nothing more than a lifeboat after a sea monster attack, trying desperately to make it to the next island before it comes back and I get swallowed up by the water. There's no earth-shattering revelation that I happened upon ruining the rest of my day. I never did find that giant eye, after all. Return of the Obra Dinn, on the other hand, is a game that does just that oddly without doing any of that. It is a mystery or detective game that takes place on a ruined ship out on the high seas. It is not itself a seafaring game, but it is a game about seafaring in its way. The premise centers around examining the bodies of the now long dead crew of the good ship Obra Dinn, using a special pocket watch to witness the moment each of them died. At first, everything is just as expected. A touch of madness here, some violent tendencies getting the better of us there, some illness, some accidents that end tragically, but it's not long before the game tips its hand and, well, turns out, ah, yeah, they had every reason to lose their minds and go a bit nuts. I'm losing my mind right now, just trying to reckon with what I'm seeing here. The tension continues to build as you unravel more and more of the story. I say tension, though there is no real danger to the player's avatar in this game. It just leaves you with some things to think about as we learn just what kind of horrors the vast oceans around us are host to. The kind of thing we relegated to myth and legend, perhaps intentionally, for our own good. I mean, would you ever go to work again if you thought this might be there waiting for you? I love Return of the Obra Dinn. It's one of my favorite games of recent memory, in large part because of how you play it and how it works as a game, but I would be lying if I said it stopped there. In truth, that morbid call of the sea was in full effect, but not from the outset. Obra Dinn began life for me as a detective game with a fun head-bending mystery to lay out. But then, a shock. 
suddenly understanding just what is happening in the past to these people, which is apparently the kind of thing that could happen to me, and they expect me to just keep being on a boat now? Like, after I've seen this? Oprah Din successfully managed to raise my anxiety and unease for nearly the duration. Just by showing me something that doesn't even enter into the game, only implying that it is possible that it's out there, maybe just under the water right now, that was enough to really get to me. Just because the waters and the boat are calm at this moment doesn't mean we are alone out here. Subnautica is a game that isn't satisfied just showing you a still image of a kraken that was hanging around however long ago. It's hard for me to fully express just how much dread this game fills me with on a very practical level. The distances this game will go to send you into exactly the kind of inky black depths that get my mind going haywire is impressive. Even the various arbitrary barriers that stop me finally standing up to my anxieties and just going and seeing what's down there are a powerful tool that this game has for keeping me on high alert. The real piece de resistance of this concoction is how they follow up on what you should be nervous about. I should make it known that historically in Subnautica I have been so desperate to avoid encountering leviathans that I don't really have any footage of them to speak of, and no, I could not bring myself to go out and deliberately get some, but yeah, there's a reason I can only do this game in small bursts. Even the reefbacks, giant gentle creatures utterly indifferent to your existence as a whole are such a commanding presence in the game that it's hard to be truly calm around them. Suddenly being able to see just how wide the gulf that separates us from them as life forms illustrates our terrifyingly small place in the world, in the universe. There was something familiar about that fear, like from when I was a school-age child, suddenly hearing my name thundering through a room as a teacher or one of my parents caught me doing something I wasn't supposed to or something I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be doing. The sudden realization that I do not belong here, and the fact that I am, is hubris. That's what I felt playing this game. And yet somehow, the moments that truly gripped me with that anxious fear of the deep, when I was at my most tense, was when my head was above water, the sky above me, and who knows what beneath me. I know perfectly well what there is to be afraid of in this game, and there is every possibility that it is swimming up on me right now. Somehow this game created a scenario wherein I felt most safe and secure when I was underwater, mixing it up with the exact things that made me most uncomfortable. Feels kind of weird to admit this, even to myself, but basically the reason I like playing as much Minecraft as I do is finding ocean biomes to take my boat out on and make maps out of. And a big part of that reason is that even though I know there are no giant sea monsters that are gonna rise out of the water and swallow me whole, it feels like there could be. And with how often this game gets updated while I'm not paying attention, it's really only a matter of time before there is one. But with the game in the form that it is in now, it feels kind of like I'm getting to conquer my phobias just on easy mode. Ultimately, I think it's that divide between air and water where this phobia of mine really lies. The sky flirting with the endless deep where known meets unknown. The place where imagination takes over and all of it is just on the other side of this border. That sentiment is exactly what Dredge is about, or at least it's what it told me it was about. A fishing boat out on sometimes calm and inviting, other times restless and threatening waters, reaching across that border and blurring the line between these worlds and how it felt dangerous to me, but also kind of exciting. Where it succeeds most in this regard isn't because of how much it embraces this fear and makes me face it down, but in how it enables my anxieties and phobias and puts them right there next to me, but importantly, just out of my reach, on the other side of that border. 
There's no moment when dredge lets you get below the surface of the water. The same thing that allows us to travel in this game to see these sights and accomplish our tasks is also a barrier that separates what is known and what will remain unknown throughout the course of the game. The true breadth and scope of the world that I am perched on the edge of in this game is meant to be baffling and intimidating. The only glimpses we get of what's below us are the fish that we pull up on board. Some are kinda goofy looking, some are kinda cute, and others are straight up majestic. But then things start getting dark. Literally. When you start getting into the abyssal and hadal speciesses that you find later in the game, well, now we've hit that existential sweet spot for me, really pushing into the world where it is very apparent I do not belong. So, if I ever want to just feel the cold clutch of fear, like, you know, for funsies, I will sometimes find myself looking at pictures of deep sea creatures on Wikipedia or just Google image search. And you ever look at pictures of a basking shark or a megamouth shark? I'm generally okay with sharks, but I am not okay with these. This is also a picture of a shark. Yeah, that a carpet shark or a wabagong shark. I mean, Dredge has you catch a gulper eel like it's just another Tuesday afternoon. Meanwhile, I, once upon a time in a biology class in university, watched a video with a gulper eel in action. And that might have been the moment that my fear of deep water really solidified itself into my soul. My first thought was like, oh, that's a real thing and not from a scary stories to tell in the dark illustration. I just noped out of ever going in the ocean ever again. <laughs> At all points in this experience, my overactive imagination is free to do what it does best. And after a while playing this game, I found myself wandering into the headspace of a person who knew nothing about the deep ocean and could know nothing beyond what I experienced firsthand. Before science had an understanding of why a creature might end up looking like this, what could I, a person living back then know about the world that lived beneath me just from laying eyes on these things I am observing. What kind of place creates a creature like this? I have no idea if people in whaling times ever wound up catching anything like a loose jaw or an anglerfish, but without a frame of reference of any kind, if they had, it seems to me that the assumption might turn into you go deep enough down, things start to get unnatural, or even demonic. There is something corrupting down there that we can't hope to understand. We just need to hope it leaves us the heck alone. Shipwrecks aplenty, tales of voyages gone wrong, and now these terrifying glimpses of the abyss? What's not to be afraid of? Every time a whale breaches the surface of the water in this game, gentle and majestic as it is, it was always a shocking reminder of not just how strange the deep sea world is, but how unfathomably vast it must be. It was always a reiteration of how I have no way of normalizing this reality for myself. I am nothing in all of this. At least in Outer Wilds, there is a whole lot of time and space between me and the end of the universe, but this... This is that good, good existential horror, but right here. Basically in my backyard. And in this game, I am bobbing along the top of it, in a boat that could probably fit inside this apartment that I'm standing in right now and I am fully relying on it to keep me above water and out of that terrifying other space that doesn't even have air for me to breathe.
It was freakishly appropriate that I played this game right when I was first getting into the band Ahab, a funeral doom metal band from Germany whose albums center around nautical fiction or histories. Regardless of the nature of whatever story they are adapting into their music, be it Moby Dick, the sinking of the Essex whale ship, or Edgar Allan Poe's The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, they are, or at least seem to be, eternally interested in the horror of these stories. How these voyages all go so horribly wrong, leaving the untamable waters to tear away the very fabric of human well-being. I haven't read nearly all of what Ahab has written about, but it was a total mood setter for playing Dredge. The sinking of the Essex or the boats of Glen Carrig are hardly the kind of mental backdrop that you would want to have right when you are off to sea. These are stories about the stripping away of the firmament we use to bring the oceans into our human world, and how specifically tenuous that venture truly is. How these great constructs, with their intricacies and complexities, mighty construction and engineering, are nothing in the face of what they are expected to defy on our behalf. There's a terrifying and pervasive reality all around us that is ready and waiting to come crashing into our situation the moment this fragile wooden structure fails us. It also helps that Ahab's music just sounds vast and hollow, like a great emptiness that is there to swallow you whole. The hostilities of our surroundings now fully coaxing out the darkness within us that we so easily push away on land, how quickly it all comes back on the water. It's the perfect backing for all of these stories of humans meeting the ocean and all that it has to offer, but on its terms, no buffers, no safety. Come to think of it, I never did allow my boat to sink while playing dredge, or rather I never had my hull take max damage. I don't know what happens if you do, and it's probably best that way. It could very well have been as easy as too bad, try again, or the game could pick you up at the last dock you visited. Whatever does happen, it couldn't possibly live up to what I am terrified it might be now. The effect the possibility still has over me, even after being done with the game, is ruinous. As I am now, I get to dwell on the potential of this unknown forever, if I want to. It kind of feels like Ahab's music sounds. I have a hard time comprehending just what my life would feel like living next to all of that all the time. The horror stories that drift back to civilization after a voyage, probably knowing one or two people who went overboard out at sea, it seems like it might be overwhelming. Like, if I was working on a whaling ship back in the day, I am sure I would end up being the freaked out nervous guy running around telling stories about ghosts in the fog and giant shadows underneath the ship that just went past just now. Suddenly, I'm not really questioning the temperament of the people of the Marrows or the strange and singular folk we find strewn across the islands. With all of the insanity of the nighttime horrors and the strange and terrifying mutated fish popping up all over the place, how does that not lead to the kind of weirdness that this game is just bathed in? Maybe a few off-putting eccentricities are warranted. The game started turning me into exactly that kind of sailor after a while. If I'm honest, I don't feel that Dredge was quite everything it could have been. There is a story in this game, a through line that leads to a conclusion. One of the myriad strange characters we meet in our travels commissions us to set about hunting for sunken treasures that supposedly serve a greater purpose while casting spells on us and our boat from a foreboding magical book in his possession to further our endeavors. The deeper implications of following the plot and story are light and non-intrusive. 
each branch of the story only initiates and concludes the chapters of the game, with everything happening in those chapters focused entirely on world building or vibe construction. Ultimately, it ends up being an excellent reason for us to explore and experience the world of the game, even if there are more than a few story threads I thought could have been tied up in more interesting ways. At times, the game is required to show its hand, to take away that unknown that lies beyond the barrier, and suddenly it wasn't as powerful as it was a moment ago. Hearing about the giant sea serpent that appears to be tearing apart the Gale Cliffs is much scarier than actually running into the thing, realizing it does you a manageable amount of damage and is more of an annoyance than an existential threat is kind of a letdown. Dealing with the mind suckers in the Twisted Strand ends up becoming so easy that I actually had trouble recreating how much trouble I had with them my first go around for footage because it just comes so easily the second time. But thankfully, the game usually has something waiting in the wings to swoop in right when it's needed and change the situation right back to a I don't know what's going on state of mind. Just about everywhere you go in the game's world, there is something to keep you wondering. Even for the really obvious stuff, we never do find out anything about the serpent in the Gale Cliffs, where the monster in the Stellar Basin came from the robed figures that demand fish hearts to satisfy an unspecified hunger are never explained. The ruined monuments at Devil's Spine tower over us, content to only tell us as much as they want to about what happened here. Every strange and fascinating character you meet along the way, the game does such a great job of leaving you with questions. I found a man marooned on an island, asking for passage back home. And when I got him there, he gave me a signet ring that I couldn't bring myself to sell to the trader. It felt too much like there might be something more to it. Just like this piece of a treasure map I have that I still don't really know what is for, and which maybe I'll look up one day, I don't know. The unease and anxiety the game generates, at least in my mind, is fully justified. The real magic, however, comes when the game pulls this off, without actually doing anything. One of the most powerful moments in the game for me was when heading out to the Twisted Strand for the first time, I passed through a small cluster of islands where I found a boat not unlike my own anchored near one of the shores. When I called out to her crew, I was met by an unseen sailor, locked in the helm, refusing to leave their tiny fortress, rambling on about a great leviathan of the deep, a gaping maw looking ever skywards, ready and waiting to consume any ship stupid enough to sail the open waters. Their request was that I finish a delivery to the Marrows on their behalf, and going back that direction, there was definitely some apprehension from me. The game has followed up on just this kind of warning before, so what do I have to be worried about this time? When I resumed my journey to the Twisted Strand, passing through those same islands, the boat was gone. And then I turned my eye to the deep dark of the waters between me and my goal. I was watching the water a little more thoroughly than usual in that stretch. Nothing happened, but what if it had, you know? I wonder if they got away. I wonder if they're somewhere they feel safe now. One time, while heading to Devil's Spine, my path was crossed by just such a leviathan. Spiny fins rising out of the water, the shadow of its massive form stretching out far in either direction. The sight of it stopped me fully there in the open water, and the image stays with me to this day. But the problem is, I didn't record my first playthrough of the game, so I don't have footage of what I saw. And then, wouldn't you know, the second time I played the game for footage, this event didn't happen. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get it to happen again. So, as soon as I had the cameras on, the monsters got shy, I guess. Or, maybe this game has truly turned me into the tall tale telling sailor, too long out on the water for his own good, that I was always meant to be. This game's really neat. 
This is the most deliberate I'm going to be about spoilers, by the way, so be warned for the next couple of paragraphs. In the game's rather rushed and what I might describe as skinny ending, the relic hunt we have been on this whole time finally comes to a head. But if you hadn't already guessed, it's time to decide whether or not the collector who has been sending us out on these assignments is bad news or not. Personally, I thought the spooky guy who seemed incapable of fully walking through a doorway the whole game, whispering scary words out of a book to make us able to teleport and kill entire schools of fish at once was suspect at best. Pressing the issue leads to, in my mind, one of the better reveals in this game. The doorframe is a mirror, the collector an image of yourself that you cannot recognize, and you have been doing this to you. I laughed a little when this happened in the game, reflecting on my own experience playing it, my nervous and anxious brain unwilling to ever put myself in this kind of situation coaxed onwards by some unknown voice within, a morbid curiosity constantly reminding myself of the allure of the unknown, the exact kind of thing that pulled me in the direction of Dredge in the first place. Was this game expecting me somehow? That's crazy, right? In the end, I listened to the pleas of the town folk. Tired of the evil that haunts these waters, the lighthouse keeper guided me to where I needed to end it. We throw the accursed book into the sea, and it's only moments later that we are swallowed whole by a gargantuan beast, finishing our story once and for all. Even with this half-hearted exit from the game, I still felt a chill down my spine at the mere suggestion that this pelagic expanse, this horrifying deep, was waiting for me. Maybe it's vain of me to think of it that way, but that offers closure, no? Some sense to all of my apprehension up till now? I had this coming to me for daring to be here at all. Or is it weird for the rabbit to feel desired by the fox? For prey to think that it isn't just hunted, but wanted? Even if we decide to give in and follow the whims of the man in the mirror, you would have to do some godlike creative arguing to say that the result is an improvement. Unless maybe you are into the idea of Eldritch Apocalypse. It doesn't matter which path we take. We are in too deep. There is no going back, and nowhere else to go. Both of these endings seem to speak specifically to my lingering dread that has followed me through all of my adventures at sea. Between the maybes of Obra Dinn, the definitelys of Subnautica, and the uncertain in-betweens of everything else, how little we actually understand about the world we are in is clearest here in Dredge. How comforting ignorance truly was. Every time I get on a boat, figuratively speaking, there has always been a thalassic uneasiness biting at my heels. I'm always watching the water, both the physical presence of it and the larger concept, with a healthy amount of side-eye and suspicious concern, terminally afraid of something rising up from beneath me and putting an end to my enjoyment. Even if the tone of the thing is plenty comforting, happy, and manageable, that overactive imagination of mine is always there, hanging around, making stuff more difficult, dwelling on that barrier. This is how Dredge becomes more than the sum of its parts for me. It is a small game that finds its vastness in the mind of the player, in the mind of this player, at least. It put into action everything that has followed me through stories or games on this theme up until now, amplified by its restraint, like finally putting a difficult thought into words. We never get to cross that border, only reach across and marvel at what we are permitted to see for ourselves, always leaving enough room for anything else to be possible. I can't wait until the next chance I get to blur that line further, and in new ways. And I can't wait to find out what is waiting for me there.